well thank you all for coming. Um, so like I said, we're just going to go over a few different things. These are some things we're going to cover today. So I'm going to go over some few things with you all about how the qualifications that organizations must have to become registered each semester and maintain, um, some benefits once they do become registered. We'll talk a little bit about some policies and procedures that we talk about with your officers. Um, that's just good for you to know as well. We'll talk about event planning, um, some funding opportunities and finances. That always gets sticky, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, like I said, we're going to do a little bit of an org sync tutorial so we can, I know people are still learning and figuring out how to navigate it. Um, and then we will also talk about just some additional resources and things we have coming up. Um, so just so you all know, organizations do have to register every long semester, fall and spring. And we do this because we found that um, if we don't do it each semester, we have too many officers and organizations that we have outdated information for. We have too much turnover in between semesters. Um, so in the fall, they have to re-register on OrgSync, so update their information on OrgSync, as well as send an officer to one of our org orientations. Uh, we start this process in late July, and um, go, it pretty much goes throughout the semester, but we are able to get most of our organizations registered by about mid-September, early September, mid-September. Um, we offer many orientations uh, from July to September, and then we kind of taper off and have less um, at that point, because we've registered most groups at that point. As long as they get registered in the fall, the only thing they had to do this spring was update their information and re-register in OrgSync. So it's much more simple. Um, that org orientation is once a year. Yes? Um, I found out that when my um, officers were trying to just update and do that, mm -hmm. they kept being declined. And the information was pretty much the exact same because nothing had really changed from the previous semester. Yeah, so, so we'll talk a little bit about that actually on the next slide, okay. about some things that uh, we did this semester that might have caused that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the other things they must do is maintain at least eight members, um, so that is required for them to register every semester. And out of those eight, they must have at least two officers. Um, just so you all are aware, these officers do have eligibility requirements that they must meet. Um, so they must have a UNT cumulative GPA of 2.4. Um, they must be enrolled in different hours depending on if they're an undergrad or grad, and they also must be in good disciplinary standing. So um, we will actually start running those reports later this week since now everyone's registered for the semester and things. Um, and if you have any officers that are ineligible, they will receive an email as well as you as the advisor um, letting you know that they do, my, do not meet the requirements. They do have an option to either basically resign at that point, um, or if they would like to appeal, there is an appeal process. Um, they have seven business days from being notified to complete that process, and there'll be a link in the email for them um, to click on and go fill out a form. Um, at that point, the Eligibility Appeals Committee will then handle their appeal. Um, if they do decide to appeal, uh, we will notify you that they've done that and notify you uh, what that decision of the committee is. Um, so that could be something that's coming. I always just tell organizations, make sure your officers are meeting these requirements before you put them into office, if possible. Um, and so we don't have to run into issues of you know, filling officer positions throughout the semester. Um, and then of course they must have a full-time faculty or staff advisor as all of you. All right, so when they are, are updating this information, this is what you have worked getting at uh, with this semester, is they do need to um, know the number of active members. They need to know all of the information of you as an advisor. They did, do need to input that information, um, as well as those of all of their officers. Um, so we actually use that information to run the eligibility reports and send out specific information to you as the advisor or them as the officers. Um, one thing that we found over part of last semester was um, we had a lot of people when we made the transition from the old platform that their constitutions were way out of date and they hadn't been updated in a very long time. And so we audited every organization's constitution during this registration process. So that's probably why they were getting denied is they had not, they did not include the updated uh, verbatim clauses and policy numbers that we have. Those were updated a few years ago, but we found with the transition that organizations were just finding whatever document they could find um, to upload uh, because they didn't have probably the most recent one that their organization had actually used. Um, so we decided just to audit everyone's this semester and make sure everyone had um, all of that information and everyone was submitting those um, constitutions that were updated and so we have denied quite a few organizations for that reason. Um, we have a sample that we tell them to, um, that we show them and put a link to for them to use. It has comment bubbles, it's pretty user friendly and it says 
Um, if they click on the comment, bubble, comment bubbles, like this is required verbatim. There's only five required verbatim clauses. There's a hazing, a membership statement, governing rules and regulations, um, advisor eligibility, so that you are all full time, and then the officer eligibility, eligibility requirements. Um, other than that, they're allowed to have any other, you know, the rest of their document can be um, particular to their organization. So we did run into that this semester, and so we're trying to make sure that everyone gets those updated um, with that information. Um, so for those of you who have been advisors for a while, we do not have a process for you to um, approve the registration anymore. Um, we're hoping that that comes back after a while, but with this new transition, there's not a way for you to approve um, what they are submitting each semester for registration. Um, and then just to note, there's a few things. As the advisor, you will be able to access the registration as well as the president, the primary contact, and anyone else who has um, registration access in their portal. So there are, all mul there are multiple people who could uh, register the organization each semester. Any questions about that? Hopefully that answered your question. Okay. Um, so once they do become registered, there's obviously some benefits that go along with it. The first is, and the one that's most important to many of them, is that they're able to hold meetings, um, have events, and make room reservations here on campus. So until they're registered, we uh, do not provide them with a room for their meetings or events and things on campus. Um, they're able to participate in university-sponsored events, so we're always sharing um, events through our office, like Mean Green Fling, Mean Green Spring Fling, which are great recruitment um, opportunities for those organizations, as well as orientations in the summer when they can go and table, um, participate in homecoming, all of those kind of large university events. Uh, they will appear in org sync to potential new members, so if an organization decides to um, or fails to register for a semester, they're actually not going to show up in our registry, um, our org directory I should say. Um, so we go through and we'll be doing this actually here in the next week or so, so anyone that hasn't gotten registered to this point, uh, we'll change them to frozen and so they'll need to reach out to us so we can change them back to active to register. So that's just to encourage them to get registered and so we're not um, advertising the organizations who are not registered with our office. Uh, they do have the opportunity to co-program with university departments. We do offer them a limited quantity of free black and white copies in our office. They can just bring a copy to our office and they get 100 copies each semester. I'll say that's not utilized very often, um, but it's always an opportunity for them to come use that. Uh, and then they can invite guest speakers to campus. All right, so we're going to move a little bit to policies and procedures. So it's just some things that we mentioned to them during orientation that I think it's also important for you all to know. I'm sure many of you all know um, that we have signs, posters, and ads here, um, a policy for signs, posters, and ads. And there are designated areas on campus um, that allow them to be put up. Uh, many of buildings have those bulletin boards where they can be, space can be requested to use them. And then some of them are more open where um, any organization or department can post on. I always just tell the organizations beforehand, if you're unsure if it's a bulletin board you should be posting on, um, reach out to the building manager, go to the closest office and ask um, or know that your you know, sign or poster could be taken down if it's a bulletin board you shouldn't be using. Yes? Is there a cumulative list of those places, those designated spaces? There is not, I will say. Um, no. Uh, I wish there was because I honestly couldn't even tell you all the places that there are on campus. Um, unfortunately, there's not a uniform process really for it besides this policy so there is not unfortunately yes something that we can maybe look into that that would be nice um so a few other things so chalking taping fires light poles trees windows doors all of the bathroom like stalls seems to be really popular I'm sure you all have seen that those are all places that they're not supposed to be posting them so when you see an organization posting those places um, we'll take it down and we'll reach out to them and just remind them of this policy and where they should be posting um, one thing that they can do is, um, I know this building in particular and the union are only digital marketing. Um, there is free digital marketing options for student orgs in the union. So if they have an event and they want to promote something, they do get that for free for up to seven days for a week. Um, so we always tell them to utilize that. Uh, and so they can actually, on the website under un um, union, there's a marketing tab and there's an option for them to go and fill out a form to uh, get that up on those boards. Did you say that's only seven days? I believe it's seven days. Yep, yep, for a week. 
Um, and then another thing, to, you know, they can always do lawn signs or yard signs as well. So those uh, student organizations are able to put those out wherever they would like, as long as they're not in flower beds or blocking, um, you know, the site of maybe someone driving down the next street to see down the next street. And they can get those made at Eagle Images or Design Works in the Union, or if they have a place that can make them, they can utilize any place they'd really like. Um, but if they're using Eagle Images or Design Works in the Union, they can also purchase the stakes there. Um, but there's not a particular, um, they don't need to check with anyone um, to get those printed or uh, check through us to get them approved um, or to put them out. They're able to just kind of do that on their own. I will Are say they limited to three days. The lawn signs? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I think they can be out as long as you would like. Yeah, I'd, I would say have them go out and pick them up right after the event. Yeah. Otherwise, other people might take them. Right. Um, I know lots of offices, if there's, I mean, if they see a lot of old lawn signs, they might just pick them up and take the stakes. So if they purchase them, you know, have them go okay. and pick them up pretty quickly. And the grounds will go and pick them up too if they're Correct. old, they've been yes. out there a while. And they can always go reach out to facilities and grounds. Sometimes they have a bunch of them in bulk that they've picked up and no one has come get to get. We actually in our office do that and go ask them so we don't have to purchase more. So they can also reach out to grounds to see if they have any uh, um, a stash, basically, that they could access. I will say for marketing purposes, we have run into a few times um, where organizations have marketed before getting a room or a specific date. Um, so I'd always suggest to them, you know, try to plan ahead of time. Make sure that you have a room or a date location, you know, date location time, all of those logistics um, booked before actually printing materials. We run into a lot of um, a few issues with them saying, well, we already marketed this. Well, we don't have that room available to you. Um, so that becomes a problem every so often. Um, so one thing to also mention is branding. So organizations forget about this, but come on in. Um, the use of the UNT logo or UNT trademark, just like any other department um, or entity here on campus, the organizations do have to follow the same process where they need to get that um, approved by URCM. And they can do that just like we do by sending a proof of whatever that is to brand review at UNT to get that um, approved. They don't have to use a specific vendor. Um, they obviously just want to make sure that they're using it in the appropriate way and things. So um, remind them of this if they're printing any type of you know, flyers, posters, if it's a t-shirt, whatever it may be. Does it have to have to do it? No, it does not. That's just only if they're using the UNT logo or trademarks. Yes. All right, solicitation. Um, so solicitation is so the attempting to sell or distribute items. So the organization is going to be soliciting. So if they're going to be distributing flyers or maybe they're going to be um, distributing candy to get people to come to their tables, they can tell more about the organization. Um, or if they're going to be fundraising, they do have to have a solicitation permit. Um, they can fill out the solicitation form if they're just having a pretty basic tabling event by going to um, the University Union website. It's online now or going to the uh, union scheduling office, which is in Union 418, and picking up a paper copy of that. It's a pretty basic one page form, um, or if they'd like to fill out the event application, that's always an option for them in OrgSync as well, um, where they fill that out for all their other meetings and events and things on campus. Um, what, the day of their event, basically once it's approved and the day of their event, they'll actually go to either the union scheduling services office or um, on the third floor in our student org workspace, there's a little desk when they enter, and they can pick up their permit there. It's just a little slip of paper saying that they are able to solicit. Um, so a few things that are not allowed. So there's very few organizations that are allowed to do raffles. Um, so raffles are illegal in the state of Texas. So there's very few uh, organizations that are able to do them. Um, so I always just tell organizations don't use the term raffle. Um, there's a lot of other ways to do fundraisers, um, and we can always double check things to make sure they're doing things and not doing things illegal um, beforehand. So we always ask for them to reach out to us if they have questions about that. Um, bake sales are not allowed, so they cannot bring anything from their home or someone else's home and bring it to campus and distribute it. Um, this does go for meetings. Obviously, this is really hard for us to track, um, but it, that does qualify as well. So they can't have a potluck. They can't be bringing a bunch of food in and be distributing that uh, during their meeting. If they're going to bring their own, you know, meal, that's totally fine. Um, but anything that is brought onto campus food-wise that's going to be distributed or handed out needs to be from a commercial kitchen, 
um, for like a Kroger or Walmart or where a health permit could be obtained. Um, so if you could remind them about that, I know that those things probably happen, but we're just not able to catch them all and regulate them all. Um, they also can't sell food, so they can sell other items. They could sell t-shirts for their organization or other things that they want to raise money for, um, but they're not able to sell food. They can ask for donations for food items, um, but they have to be very specific in their wording about that, and we always ask if they're going to be asking for donations for anything, whether that's at their meeting or their event or their table out in the library mall, that they have some type of signage that's letting people know what they're donating to. So it could be their organization, it could be a nonprofit, um, whatever it may be, but we want people to know where the funds are going to be going towards. With regard to selling food, uh, yes. we typically do a tamale fundraiser where we go out in the world, buy some tamales, and um, deliver them a month or so later. Um, yes. Are we breaking the rules? So if you're doing it on campus, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. yes. So you technically can't sell food on campus at all. It only You can only ask for donations for food items. So the flyer um, needs to be say, say something about donations and we need to bring it by um, somewhere to get that approved previously. Yes, so if y'all are having some type of event where you're going to be doing this. Well, it's not an event, it's a fundraiser that uh, kind of sent out to the COB and we're having a tamale fundraiser. I actually bought some of them. Well, <laughs> if they um, were good. If they were. If they weren't, sorry. Okay. Yes, so I would, so the best person to probably ask about that is going to be, so food safety is going to want to know what you're doing and bringing on campus because um, they actually need to, they want to check everything that's coming onto campus, whether it's a department, a student organization, or whatnot. Um, and we probably have to check, we probably have to check with the, I would say Brittany would probably be our best bet. So she works with our, she's our event safety committee chair. Um, so she kind of helps coordinate with risk management, food safety, and all those things, and talks to organizations specifically about fundraising and make sure, make sure they're doing policies correctly. Um, so she might be the best person to reach out to directly and I can get you her information um, or you can reach out to me and I can connect you with them. Um, but yes, you technically can't sell food on campus um, at all. And they were packaged like you bought them at Kroger or someplace like that. They were packaged. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you're asking for donations, that would be fine. Um, but if it says $12 uh, for a yeah. package of something. Yeah, then that kind of like not wait, be <laughs> So is it kind of like when people bring like their kids booklets to like sell like the the gift wrapped or whatever? Do they like sign up and then you bring it back to them? Uh -huh. Yeah, so the reason that this this gets a little tricky and so there are specific market days on campus where businesses are allowed to come and sell items. Um, so those type of, I guess, opportunities are supposed to be limited to those days. Um, so even like Girl Scouts, we've run into this with organizations wanting to work with Girl Scouts. They cannot technically work with Girl Scouts and have them come and sell cookies at their event um, because we just can't allow selling food on campus. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else I guess to say yeah, about was, it, but it's, it gets tricky I mean, and I know there's a lot of things that probably happen on the department side of things, um, but as a student organization they are not allowed to do that. I mean both are not allowed, but I know that. Things probably have so they can't do a little fundraiser where they like have people kind of catalog and they just deliver it, have it delivered to their house or whatever. You know so, what I mean? Does that make sense? Yes. So that's essentially what it sounds like they're doing. Like they pick, yeah, they take that orders. And they just I take can the look orders. at. Let me look into that because we it's haven't had like anyone ask us recently about it. Um, but yeah, let me look into that. I'll make a note of that, and um, I'll make sure to grab your guys' information. Well, I'll have your information as well, and I can get back to you about that. Um, but I know it does get a little tricky. Yeah, I mean, I understand when, like the exchange on the spot, like Girl Scouts, you give me money, I get the cookie yep. or whatever. Yep. But with that, it's like, well, I'm not necessarily like swapping this with you right now. I'm ordering something, and yes. it's delivered to me way later, so it's not an exact like point of sale. Yes, that which that might be allowed. I'd have to double check because I don't think I've ever been asked about an actual them bringing a catalog, like you had mentioned. Yeah. Um, but yeah, something like a Girl Scouts where they're actually coming and there's like an exchange of money and things like they can't sell directly like that. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, so the right to free speech and assembly. So I just want to mention this quickly because there are free speech areas on campus, I'm sure um, you guys might know about them, um, but organizations can utilize them for. Uh, their events and they can uh, actually 
book those spaces for whether it's a, you know, a fundraising opportunity, if they just want to have a table out there and get their word out or whatever it may be. Um, so one thing to note that we do have a few restrictions on. So um, they can have amplified sound, but only from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 5 um, to 10 p.m. in the majority of those free speech areas. Uh, that's just because we've obviously got classes and things going on, um, and so they are limited to having amplified sound at those times. Um, it also can only be up to 92 decibels. So if we have any issues with that, we just go and talk to them directly while it's happening. Um, we haven't really had any issues lately, so hopefully that will continue. Um, but if they're also doing anything that's going to be like a parade or march, or they're using a, an outside structure, um, so we do have organizations who will bring like large boards um, with information on it, or you know groups who might bring in like a dunk tank or like some other things like that to do activities out in the library mall. Um, those are all things that we want to know about, and there's going to be a few extra people on their event application that are going to give those approvals and make sure that things are happening. Um, in a safe way. So um, if you know about these things, um, make sure that they are including them in their event application and they're providing us lots of information so we can make sure um, that everyone that needs to give their approval does. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk a little bit about some like funding and finance uh, opportunities. So um, I want you all to know that there is a funding opportunity through the Student Government Association for all organizations to have funding for events that might be open to, um, if they have an event that's open to everyone here on campus. Um, so this is one opportunity. There is a resource meeting that they will first attend where they'll, le they'll learn a little bit more about the process, um, talk about the application, and then they'll be able to fill out the application uh, with more details and be uh, notified after they meet with the uh, committee of whether they will actually receive that funding. Um, so this is a great opportunity for them, especially if they're wanting to do something big, they maybe not, don't have the funds to do it, uh, this is an option for them. And we don't have any graduate, I don't think anyone is a graduate organization. Okay. What does that funding look like? How, how, how much might they receive? Um, I don't know if they have any limitations, that would be a good question for them of what, how much. Uh, but I have seen, I mean, thousands of dollars. I mean, I've seen three, four thousand, you know, thousands of dollars per event. Um, so they can get a lot, a lot of money. I can't remember if there's a limitation on like the maximum they could receive, um, but SGA would obviously have that answer as well. And the students get all this information when they go through the orientation. Correct. Okay. Yes. I'm just hoping you will remind them that it's an option. <laughs> All right, and so one other option that they have is um, a travel grant. So the route travel grant is also so also through the Student Government Association. Um, and so this is just for travel. So if they're going to a competition or a conference or something for their organization, um, they can get funding for that. They do have to do this beforehand, so they do have to plan it out a little bit. Um, but they'll attend a resource meeting. It's actually in conjunction with the Eagle's Nest uh, resource meeting, so they can learn about both at once. Um, and there's an application process and things like that. Um, they can get... I think it's I think it's up to three thousand for four officers or seven fifty for one uh, student. Uh, so they can get a lot of money through uh, this uh, funding opportunity as well. So I hope you'll encourage them um, to do this. I do know that they have to have a faculty or staff member. It doesn't have to be you as the advisor, but a faculty or staff member um, provide a reference letter. So um, they could ask you about that if it's um, in relation to their organization, obviously, because you may be able to talk about. Um, their experience with that organization. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Is the travel grant available to uh, students other than the presidents or officers? Yes. Okay. So yes, there's an indiv there's individual students, and then there's um, like if up to four officers were going. There's like a certain amount that four officers can get. Okay. So. Do you have a question? Okay. All right, and Student Organization of the Month. Um, so we actually award a Student Organization of the Month in um, September, October, November, and February, March, and April of every year. And so basically it's a simple form on OrgSync that they fill out. They just tell us all the great things that they've been doing. We give them an opportunity to upload pictures or documents or things um, of what they're doing, and then we select a Student Organization of the Month. They're notified as well as the advisor. We put them in our social media, um, in our president's newsletter that goes out every Wednesday. Um, and then they actually will get $100 that they can use towards their organization for something. 
Um, we don't directly give them this money. We work with them to purchase things on their behalf. So um, if they're having an upcoming event, we can help pay for you know catering here on campus, or if they have an AV bill, or um, if they want to have a pizza party, we can you know help pay up to hundred dollars for pizza, or um, maybe marketing or advertising materials, things like that, are what we have um, done in the past. So these are always due the 15th of the month, and then we award one. So the first one is going to be due coming up here in a couple of weeks on February 15th. Um, yes? Your slides here. Uh, if I just not pick them up on the way in, or is so, there any of these? Yes. So we are going to um, we record this, and then we will also put up the slides and the recording on our website as well. Okay. And I'm yes. going to write my name, and you're going to send me an email saying, go here. Yes, I can this. do that. Okay. Yep. Um, and it's always our, we always add them to the same website where all our other resources are for advisors. It's studentactivities.unt.edu slash advisors. So that's where all of our information for advisors are. Um, and I can, yeah, I can send an email to all of you with the PowerPoint as well if you would like that. Um, and then we'll also have the recording um, in about a week or so. Um, after we get it put together, we actually mix in the PowerPoint with the recording. All right, so we're going to talk about a little bit about finances uh, for those who actually handle money. So if your organization is handling money in any way, we hope that they have a checking account so that they have a place for those funds to go to um, or for, for them to be stored. Um, and so if your organization already has a checking account, if you'll see on the right, uh, we do have a process for helping organizations, um, especially who use Wells Fargo here on campus to get uh, the account switched over from different officers and advisors. Uh, so we have a form on OrgSync. Anyone currently on the account can fill that out um, and add and remove uh, any current officers or advisors. So they do have to be listed as a current officer or advisor to be added. Um, we will then ask the president and the advisor to approve of those changes. Once we get those approvals, we'll send a PDF letter. And actually, Alex is the one who sends them, my graduate assistant. She'll send a PDF letter to the email that they provide. Um, and then they can actually take that to the bank. And everyone who is being added does have to go at one time. Um, but then they can all get added to the account. So we have that process in place to help organizations, uh, specifically those here uh, on campus. With, we have a partnership with Wells Fargo here. Uh, for organizations who do not have account, but they're handling money and should, um, there's just some steps here on the left of how they can go about creating it. Um, they do have to apply for a tax ID number, and we do have a lot of information about our on our website about this as well. So it takes them through a little step by step. Um, and once they get that ID number, they can fill out the checking account form. We can give them a PDF letter, just like uh, those who are making those changes, and they can go to the bank um, and set that up. They are able to use any financial institution they wish. So we obviously do have a good number of organizations who use Wells Fargo because it's convenient here. But I will say, um, we also have had a number of organization closed accounts there because they just couldn't meet the minimum requirements of the accounts that they had opened. So um, if you're if they're going to open an account, maybe check with them. We tell them, you know, make sure you know what the minimum requirements are. If you're end up getting charged because you don't have five hundred dollars in your account and losing money, that's obviously not. Uh, beneficial, so we they are able to go any to any financial institution they wish and set up an account. We obviously don't have partnerships with <coughs> really anyone else besides Wells Fargo, so um, that process we really only do for those that work with Wells Fargo here. So are they required to have an account? They are not, but if they were handling money in any way, if they're collecting dues, they're going to be having fundraisers. I highly suggest they have an account to be putting that money. So in. what if they're like related to like a large like. Yes, they're bigger, and they have like a they, the student part, and then they have their own. And mm -hmm. we're the same, like we're a nonprofit, but the student part is there's a student org connected. Mm -hmm. So if we manage that and then give it to the org or pay for the org to do different things on campus, that's fine if that's the way that y'all have it set up. Okay. Um, but if I guess. If there's as long as they're able to put money that they're making into some type of account is really what we're worried about we don't want to have an individual student carrying around cash oh, yeah. or an individual student who has the money in their account and then all of a sudden they disappear yeah, um, they so we've had those issues in the past but if you guys have something I mean we obviously have other organizations who work with departments and things and if it's set up in that way and it works for both then that is fine we just want to make sure that they have an account that they're able to put money into um. I don't know if we're going to talk about this, I'm going to ask now. That's good. 
what is is there a such thing as like department sponsorship? Um, in what sense? I don't know. Someone <laughs> asked me that one, and I was I was I don't know what they're talking about, so I didn't know if that was a thing. Um, no such thing as department sponsoring. Support. I mean, if if a department is wanting to provide money to a student organization, that would be up to them to determine if they wanted to do that. But I don't know if there's there's not really a formal process or anything that I know about that would be turned to them. I guess. Oh, because I'm like, is there any benefit for the department to do that? There, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't know. I just it was interesting. Yeah, well, if you get more information about that, let me know. But I don't know anything other than, I mean, if a department wanted to provide funds to an organization, then that would just be up to them to decide that. Didn't sound okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about taxes. Um, so we do mention this to student organizations because um, I'm sure you all probably know we've got the state and the federal tax. We do mention that to them. Um, the thing we talk to them mostly about is if your organization is bringing in more than $5,000 annually, you should be paying federal income tax. Most of our organizations are not, um, and those that are bringing in that amount of money have the support from usually national headquarters and are going about all of those things in the right way. Um, the one thing that we talk to them pretty strongly about is tax exemption. Um, so we'll have organizations show up at our office and saying, like, I'm going to do this fundraiser and I need, you know, like, we are supposed to be told that we're, you know, we're supposed to tell them that we're tax exempt. We don't know what that means. We need this number and we don't have it. Um, so we let them know that most of them are not tax exempt. Um, they cannot use UNT's um, status because while they are organiz organizations here, um, they're not necessarily part of UNT. Um, so I let them know that if they have a national or state affiliate, make sure you're reaching out to them. A lot of times they will provide that status um, and allow them to use that. If not, um, one thing that we can do in our office that we provide is we do have a spot like a sponsorship letter, which I don't know, maybe this is what they were talking about, um, that we can just basically write out saying um, such and such organization is an organization here on campus, but they're not operating for a profit. So essentially they're um, you know, they're not trying to profit off of what their funder, you know, they're just trying to have an event for their organization and raise a little money to do so. Um, so we can provide that letter to them um, if they go out and ask for donations from businesses or, you know, sponsors and they're a little reluctant because they're not tax exempt. Um, I just always tell them beforehand if you're going to go um, and do something with maybe a night at Chipotle or, you know, some of those, just make sure that you're um, conveying that to them before you start the process so you don't get into a pickle um, and have all these documents you need to fill out and you don't have, like, you're not able to because you don't meet these requirements. Um, so we do talk to them about that. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about OrgSync. Does anyone have any questions before we go to the... Okay. Um, so we do have a, so for those of y'all who have maybe not been able to get to um, our website yet or to this specific uh, link, so studentactivities.unt.edu slash orgsync um, is a web page that we created when we moved um, to our new orgsync platform over the summer, last summer. And this was to kind of help uh, organizations, advisors, students kind of help navigate through the new platform and learn how to use it. Um, so you can see how this was the information that we had sent out to all those individuals uh, late last summer. And then we kind of have it broken down by different categories. So um, student org officers, administrators, um, and there's actually a section down here for advisors as well. Um, any of the links that are, you'll see these different links, are basically step-by-step -step tutorials on how to do different things in org sync. Uh, so we hope that those will be beneficial. If our office is not open, I always tell them, I know you all are operating at very late hours of the night because I get emails at very late hours, which I'm sure most of you do as well. Um, so I tell them, you know, check out this website if we're not available, and hopefully it can help you out. If not, reach out to our office, obviously. Um, we're going to just log in here, and I'm just going to give you a little quick tutorial um, about some of the things that we mentioned to them. So when we log in, um, I tell our students that anyone with a UNT credential can log in. So uh, students, faculty, staff, whoever it might be, anyone with a UNT credential can log in. Um, but we uh, are sending students who are wanting to get involved, uh, wanting to get connected, or maybe new students here. 
uh, to this Explore page to go learn a little bit more about our organizations, our events, things that are happening here um, on campus. So this is a page that uh, they can go and check those things out. There'll be a little information. We do have some link, campus links down here for them. Um, and then there's these different selections up here. So they can actually just go check out all the upcoming events. They can search by different terms. Uh, they can look by different categories and themes and perks. Um, and so that's where we tell our students to go check out what's going on with our organizations. Um, they're also able to search by organization name. So they can search by name or keyword, um, or if a student is looking for a specific category, uh, they can do so as well. When they click on any of these organizations, we'll just choose this one. Um, a little bit of information is going to pop up, so I remind our organizations when you're registering, um, this, make sure this information is up to date because this is where we're going to direct students to get in contact with you and your organization, and they can learn, learn a little bit more about you. Uh, so you'll see that there's an email. Um, if they have social media, it will be here. A little bit about uh, their how many you know their membership or either meeting times or whatever it might be. Some of them will have this information, some of them will not. Um, and then there also may have some officers that they could reach out to as well. Uh, these two buttons are also available for every, or on every organization portal. Um, so students have the option to join, which means that they will uh, show up as a pending member in the organization's roster or prospective, I should say, prospective member in the organization's roster. Uh, so I'll show you all where that is when we get to the portal, but we encourage them to reach out to those students um, and you know talk to them about their membership. And then there's also a contact button, so they can also contact them and learn a little bit more about the organization. And those are going to go to the primary contact and anyone who has all access in the portal. Um, this little, I have my picture up here, but you might just have an initial. This is everything that's specific to you as a user. So this is called our user drawer. Um, I let organizations know. So one of the biggest things that we ran into when we uh, started this new platform is um, anyone who's being added to a roster, being added as a member, they have to use their campus email address that's attached to their OrgSync account. And we actually pull that information from them. Um, EIS and so some students don't even realize what their campus email address is for some of them it's their first name last name at my.unt.edu and for some of them it's their EUID at unt.edu email um, so we do tell them to go to their account so that they can check out uh, what campus email addresses attached their account so they can make sure that they're being added to all the rosters that they need to um, and one big thing that we send them to in this area is uh, submission. So anytime that they submit something or if you submit a form or whatever it may be, um, you're actually able to go and check out uh, the status of any forms, elections, organization registrations, or events that might be submitted. Um, so they can go check this out. They can see the status of it. If something gets denied, so for the organization registration, I'll let you all know, if we deny them, they do not have to fill it all back out again. Um, they can go to their denied submission and just edit those pages or sections or steps that we have asked them to edit. So um, it should be a pretty quick uh, process. They're not having to go and type everything back out again every time, like every time we deny them. Uh, one thing to mention for you all um, that you might want to check out is if you, I guess if you check on click on account um, and notifications. If you're getting a lot of notifications and you want to limit those. You can do that. Um, you'll see that there's just some common notifications, but if you click on this blue button, it's going to bring a whole um, selection of different uh, things that you can be notified about. If you select uh, System, it's going to go to your inbox here in OrgSync, so you'll have to log in, and then obviously email is going to go to uh, the campus email address attached to your account here. All right, so that's a little bit about user drawer. Um, so these nine black dots are called our switchboard icon, and this is where you switch kind of views, as I like to say. Um, I only have this admin one, so you can ignore that one, but we were just in Explore, and now we're going to go to Manage, and I tell our organizations, this is where you go to manage your organization. Um, so this is their action center, and you have an action center as well. Um, so when you come to this area, you're going to see all the memberships, so all the rosters that you're included. So obviously, you probably will see the organization that you advise, and if you advise multiple organizations, or maybe you have in the past, you might see those up here as well. Um, and then one really important section. John? Yes. Uh, I, I missed where you got here. So where do you log in to this? And that was a while back, but uh, yes. could you log in again? 
Yes, yeah, so um, I actually, so there's two places that you can go. So studentactivities.unt.edu on our main page. You're gonna see a button right here under Get Connected. Um, or if you go to studentactivities.unt.edu slash org sync, there's also a login button here. So there's two places and we direct everyone to go to our site because we also want you to see all the resources and other things that we have connected to it. So um, those are the two places that you could go on our website to find it. Um, obviously, I would I bookmark everything so you could bookmark it once you get there. Um, and then it once you click, it's going to take you directly to the page to log in. Obviously, it's going to take. Um, One of the things you just said is that students, when they go here, they can see what email account yes. um, is attached to their records. Is this all records or, or just the org sync? Uh, it, it is all 38,000 students um, can go here or is it just students who are, um, well, to become a member, it should be all, all, it's all students? Yes, so and when they're logging in, they're using their EUID, so they're not using their email. Um, it comes up, I guess the email specifically comes into play when they're getting added to their roster. So this is pulling from UNT's data, so they essentially could use that, but, but the same thing is if they would go into EIS and go look under their emails, whatever their preferred is, is also gonna be what the one is attached to work sync, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, but so what I just heard you say is this is not the place where they need to change their email where they get all their UNT. No. Um, that's somewhere else. You know where that's somewhere else <laughs> Correct. is. Correct, yeah, we'll that is not. We'll talk afterwards. There is an option for though for them though to add a preferred email in in here and it's right below where I showed you the campus email. So they have the option to do that. So we do have a lot of students who will put in like a Gmail account or something like that. But I, it, they still have to be added to any roster using that campus email because it doesn't recognize the Gmails and the anything outside of a UNT credentialed email. But if this other place that I'm about to find out about, <laughs> yep. if they change their preferred email there, mm -hmm. and it's not a UNT email, then that will show up here. Yes, and I will say we do have a few students that do have those emails, but it's very, very, very few. Yes. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it d does, but so yeah, many so of them do not check their my UNT, so I just need to let them know, yes. well, what email do you check? Go here to change it. Correct, yes, and so they can actually just do that on their EIS, on their like my.unt.edu, they're on their contact, there's like a contact information page, I don't know if that's exactly what it's called, but it has their address, their email, their all of their contact information, and um, that's where they actually have a preferred selected. And I don't know if it would let them choose another email as their preferred because of FERPA. Yeah, they're required to use their mind. Yeah. But they can have it forwarded from Yeah, they can roll they can they can roll their goes, and then it to goes the other one. Okay. Yes. Yes. Which is what most of yes. them have. Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Did I answer all those questions hopefully? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Alright, so once you're here in this action center, um, so one thing I want to mention to all to all of you as advisors is any time that your organization submits an event application, um, you are um, you as well as the president are going to be notified of that and we'll have to approve that before we continue the process of booking a space and giving any other approvals. Um, so you will get an email about those um, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can make sure those aren't going to your junk or your um, spam or anything like that. Um, but you can also log in now and go and see all the ones you need to approve. So under this pending submissions, um, you're not probably going to see any forms. Uh, but you'll see any pending event submissions that uh, you will have to give a, it's a thumbs up or thumbs down now. Um, as, and then those will, all be, will, those will also just stay there until we've fully approved them. So you can see the status of them. It will just show your thumb up or thumb down next to it. Um, so if you prefer to just log in and go through all the ones you might have, maybe an organization said, yeah, we just submitted 10 event apps. It might be easier for you to just log in and go look at all 10 of them here in your action center. Um, yes. If the organization has co-presidents, does more than one president have to approve? So whoever is listed as the president chief officer in their roster will be the one who will get notified. Okay. 
So, yeah, we do have we do have a few organizations who I know have that, but we tell them like they have to designate one person to be that primary contact, um, and that's who will get added. Yeah. And the primary contact doesn't necessarily have to be called president. They can be called whoever Correct. whoever the head of the organization is. Correct. Yes, okay. and we we just use the term president chief officer, but they they can use a different term in their organization uh, if they wish. Yep. All right. So I'm just going to select Quiz Bowl. I'm actually a uh, Quiz Bowl club advisor. I work with them. Um, so we're just going to select their uh, portal, and I'm just going to walk you through a few of the tools and things that are in each portal that y'all can uh, utilize or talk to your organizations about. So when you click on it, it's gonna give you a little basic information. It's gonna give you information about who, a, who the primary contact is. Um, and if the organization is not registered for the semester, a big blue re-register this organization button is going to appear when they click on the portal. So Quiz Bowl Club is already registered for the semester, so that does not appear. But if you go to your portal and you see that, you know that your organization is not registered for the semester. Um, and these three little lines here are called the org tool menu. So these are all the tools uh, for the organization, and we're just going to kind of go down the line a little bit uh, oh, with those can you here. Step back for you said three little lines. Yep. Oh, right okay. Here. Okay. So, yep. Okay. Yes, they're not very large. I wish it was a little bigger on the screen. Um, so the roster tool is the first one we're going to go to here. So uh, this is a step in the organization registration as well, where they go and designate who they're present, their advisor, their second officer, and any other officer positions that they want to in this process. Uh, so once they do that, those will get added, but when they want to go and add other people to their roster or assign them access to the portal, they're able to do that through this step. So if they want to change their primary contact, they can do so by just clicking this blue, blue pencil and selecting a new person in their roster to be that person. Um, um, yeah. Who, who all has access to this? The, uh, so I do, the, the advisor does. The advisor, the president, the primary contact, and then anyone that they have given access. So they actually do that by um, going to this manage positions here. And they're able to give uh, access by different positions. So if they create a position here, let's say it's going to be treasurer, uh, they're able to type in treasurer here, select them as an officer, and be able to give them whatever access level they prefer. Um, so some organizations will say, yeah, I want the treasurer to have all access. Some of them will say, no, I just want them to have limited. I want them to be able to have full access to documents, um, we actually don't have finance, but uh, maybe to forms and just be able to uh, view the roster. And then they create that uh, position and they're able to go back to the roster and actually use this blue little tool to assign that position treasurer to that specific person. Um, so that's how they go and give access to others. So like I said, we're going to give the president and the advisor and whoever the primary contact is all access, but it's up to them to go give access to any other officers or people in their portal. Um, so hopefully they're doing that. Um, otherwise, it's going to be up to basically the president and primary contact, which usually is the same person, uh, to be doing everything in the portal. Um, this is where they're going to see any of their prospective members. So they'll see a list here. So that you can see they actually have four people who had clicked that join button and are interested in their organization. Um, and this will be any pending, so anyone that they've invited to join their roster and be a part of their organization will show up in pending until they've accepted that membership invitation. Um, if they want to invite more people, they can do so by clicking this button, um, and they actually just type in their email address. Uh, it has to be that campus email address attached to their account, and they're able to send out an invite for them to join the portal. Um, so this is where they can kind of manage their roster and all access to things. Yes. How do they follow up with the prospective members? So, so they can either approve or deny, and then they'll have an option to click on them. Hopefully they have an email attached. 99% um, do, because they haven't gone in and taken that uh, away. Um, and so they can actually just reach out to them. All right, so we're going to move on to the next one. Um, so about is just a little bit of information that you saw on the Explore side. It's just the basic information about the organization. Um, they're able to edit this at any point, but it's also part of the registration. Uh, events, this is where they're going to go and fill out the event application. So anytime they're having an event here on campus and they need to request space, 
uh, they're going to go to this blue create event button and actually fill out that event application. Um, if someone doesn't see that blue button, it's because they weren't given access to this events to the events tool. Um, so they'll have to go give that access to them. Um, and then they'll see all of their approved. You can see they have all their weekly meetings are approved for the semester and they can go and check out those. Uh, news, they can create news posts uh, that can either be specific to their organization so they can decide if they just want to go to the roster or the certain positions in their uh, portal or if they want it to be accessible to anyone, it will show up on that explore page under news um, if they want anyone to be able to see it. So we'll have organizations who are maybe having auditions for something um, or some big event put up a news post so that anyone can see on the explore page about what's going on with their organization. Uh, they are able to add pictures, which we suggest they do. Um, they can keep their documents stored here, so all of them, their uh, constitution and bylaws are going to show up here, and they can store any other governing documents. They can decide uh, who has access. They can do access levels, so maybe there's certain documents they only want officers to see. They can do that, um, and I do suggest you know, having them store all those here and not a Google Drive or something because we do run into that issue all the time um, where <laughs> they lose access to things and don't have those documents. Question? Um, you just said, so they can put an announcement in there. Is, is that what's in showing news. up on that uh, portal? The first page when you came in, there were several coming events for a student? For um, yes, I can actually show you. So it's, So if you go to the main, um, so they're going to show down here the latest news. So these are going to be the latest ones that were submitted. But then if they go to news here, they're going to see all of them that have been submitted. If that makes sense. So the latest ones are just going to be obviously the most recent. And then they could see all of them here. All right, and then um, forms. So if they want to create a form for the organization, they can do so. I always tell them, don't waste paper for like an application or something. You can actually create a really cool form in here and just have everyone submit information through a form and save some trees. Um, I'm sure Emily would <laughs> agree that that would be the sustainable thing to do. Um, so they do have the option to do that um, here. And one new tool that is really cool to this uh, new our new orgs and platform is they do have the option to do elections uh, through org sync. So whether it's just a simple maybe poll that they want to take or if they want to do their full officer election process, they are able to do that through org sync. Um, it's all anonymous, so whoever is running the elections, they will never know who voted for who. They'll just get the results at the end. Um, so this is a really great new tool that we have that we hope every uh, or organizations will actually utilize. All right, any questions? That was kind of quick here. I know we're wrapping up. Um, I'm going to just quick give you guys a little bit of information on our event planning. Um, if you have to go, go ahead and step out. No, I know we're running uh, short on time. Um, events quick. So like I mentioned, the president and the advisor are always going to have to approve every event. Um, and when we're talking about, uh, we do say that if events are going to be risky in any sense to give 15 business days um, so that we can have them meet with the event safety committee if that's going to be required and make sure we get all the approvals that we need. Um, so this is usually events that are going to have more than 100 people, have food, um, might you know be doing something risky where we're going to have to bring risk management in, so having a dunk tank or um, like a large dance or bringing off campus guests, some of those things uh, we're going to want those 15 business days to be able to approve all that time. Um, the event safety committee is a committee of uh, different people from uh, risk management. Um, I sit on that committee, uh, the police department, uh, food safety, our reps from our different buildings, um, they all come together to form that committee to make sure that our events here for student organizations are being held safely and we can help them think about all the things that they may need to put into place uh, for that to happen. Um, classrooms and series meetings, um, so I just want to, uh, some of our organizations forget that they can book their class or their series meet or a series meeting uh, for the whole semester, so you can remind them that they can actually do that by submitting one event application and we can try to book them uh, the same space for the whole semester. Is it um, too late to do that for this, this semester? Oh no, we've still got tons of event applications pending, so have them submit those um, and they'll just have to get your approval as well as the president's and yeah, we'll be able to book them a space. 
the further we get into the semester, obviously the more limited we are on spaces, so they might have to be a little more flexible, date or time or maybe a location. Um, like this building in particular goes very, very fast. Um, there's also a lot more classes being held in this building now than there ever was. Uh, so they might have to be a little flexible, but yes, we can book them spaces all throughout the semester. Um, and just to remind them to provide as much detail as possible, um, y'all, part of your job in approving events is to make sure that they're providing all that information and it's accurate um, and that you're checking to see what they're doing. Um, so make sure you're checking out the details because you are one of those approval people before we even book it. If you say, um, put thumbs down and say you can't have this event, it, it will not continue. We will deny it. Um, so you and the president have that um, ability to do that with those events. So make sure you're just reading through and knowing what they're doing. Yep. As far as concerning space, uh, yeah. my understanding is there's some space over in, some, in the student union or somewhere yes. where they can store banners and prop flyers and just all their stuff. So yes, we do have uh, lockers for student organizations. So every fall we open an application process for lockers. Um, and those organizations that are given lockers, which I will say we've been able to accommodate everyone to this point, um, do have them for the entire year where we give them a key and they're able to store whatever materials they need to in that space. We have two different sizes, um, a full and a split size. So the split are kind of probably about this tall, this wide, um, and the full are about the size of like a door. So they're pretty large. We don't have as many of the full, so if they're gonna store a lot of large things, um, I'd tell them to get registered really quickly in the fall and submit that application right away. For ongoing organizations, do they get some sort of email saying, do you want to re-up on this uh, on this locker? So or they actually just... have to check them out. So they actually have to check out of them every May because um, we do do, we clean them and we do maintenance on them every summer. Um, so from about end of August to May, they are able to occupy them um, and we do have them check out. And we do not follow up necessarily with those organizations that have gotten them in the previous year because we want to be able to give the opportunity to every organization. So just every organization that uh, was registered in the previous semester gets the same information about it. Um, and we talk to them about it in org orientation as well as, um, you know, when we're sending out information about registration. There's still, there's like eight left, but they're only the split sizes. Yes, so eight left this semester. We have about 86 of them, 80 some of them total, so. All right, and then just one thing to know is uh, the last day to hold an event this semester is April 30th, so organizations cannot hold any type of activities, whether that's a meeting, tabling events, whatever it may be, uh, during pre-finals, reading days, and finals days. Um, they, if they want to have something, they do have to get approval for the, through, um, from Dr. McGinnis, the Dean of Students. Uh, and she, they can do that for the event application process. They'll have to just answer a question about that. I will say 99% of the time she does not approve anything during those days. Um, so if you can just encourage them to plan anything um, before that time. Uh, just a few things to note. I'm sure that you guys have all gotten these emails, but these are a little bit about the emails and what they might look like um, when you're asked to uh, review an event application. Um, you might see some comments, so you can check up on those. Um, and then I just have a few tips and tricks for those. So add a rule, um, you can add a rule that says um, basically this no reply at engage.mail.canvaslabs.com. Um, basically you can add a rule that says all of those emails go to this certain folder. Um, and then you can make sure that they don't go to your junk or your spam um, and you don't miss out any of them. I have that so that I make sure I don't miss anything. Um, and just check your clutter and junk every so often. Um, and then, you know, have an expectation with your organization to reach out to you. Uh, if they're maybe not so good about communicating with you about when they're going to be submitting things, then you can have a heads up. Um, I tell them that as well, is be in communication with your advisor. Don't expect to submit something and they're going to improve it in five minutes. Like, reach out to them. Make sure you give them ample time to be able to do, uh, to get to check it out and actually approve it in the amount of time that you all need to take to review it. Um, all right, just a few things that we have going on this semester. So we do have a treasurer's training. If you think you have a treasurer in your organization that you think might benefit from this, uh, this is actually happening next week, and we've reached out directly to those treasurers to let them know. Uh, we partner with the Student Money Management Center to do that training. Uh, we're going to have another advisor workshop at the end of the month. Um, I haven't announced the topic yet because I'm still waiting to hear back, uh, but I'm excited about it if it, it is good, it all happens. 
Um, and then we will have an advisor reception to just thank you all for the time that you spent uh, working as an advisor on April 9th, and we'll send out some more details about this, but it'll be a come and go event from 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. Um, it should say 1.30 p.m. in uh, somewhere in the union. Uh, just encourage organizations to participate in Mean Green Fling, Mean Green Spring Fling. Um, we also have involvement fairs that we've started these last couple years where we'll invite certain categories of student organizations to just basically a small fair out in the library mall as long as the weather's nice. Um, and gives them just another opportunity uh, to be around the other organizations in their category um, and to recruit and talk about the events and things that are happening with students passing by. Um, Eagle Awards, so we do a Eagle Awards banquet where we recognize um, advisors like yourself, org officers, uh, students, organizations for all the great things they're doing. Um, and all of those uh, people are chosen through the nomin through nominations that um, you as advisors, staff, staff, faculty, and students uh, provide. So make sure you're nominating um, your organization or students for those awards. I'll send out that information um, when they open up. Um, you also might get some, uh, for our Golden Eagle Award in particular, they do have to have a recommendation letter, so you might be asked uh, to provide that for those who might be applying for the Golden Eagle Award as well. Um, we also have a lot of uh, things that we do at the Center for Leadership and Service. They have a leadership conference every spring that we, or every fall, uh, that we encourage organizations and their officers to attend. Um, we have some leadership lunches throughout the semester that are uh, they can come once or come every time. We provide lunch that we encourage them to attend. Um, and leadership is a big uh, kind of extensive leadership um, experience that students have here at UNT the week after finals in May uh, where we encourage students to participate in that event. I've been able to actually be a cluster facilitator and it's a great experience. So um, if you think you have a student who might be interested in something a little more extensive, they go off campus for a week. Um, that's a great opportunity for them. 